Hi there. Today we're going to be talking about the introduction to cells and topic that's topic 1.1 in the IB curriculum. So some of the things that we need to be able to know are the cell theory, um, how multicellular organisms and emergent properties are kind of related to the cells, um, the surface area to volume ratio, uh, the cell differentiation and specialization of tissues along with some stem cells. Some of the things that we need to know how to do are calculate the image uh, magnification of cell drawings, calculate the actual size of the structures and the alter structures within the drawings, and be able to make some estimates about those, as well as doing calculations of the sizes of the objects within the microorgan or the excuse me within the micrographs. So um, cell theory is one of the basic tenets of biology, and, and uh, the main one here is that all cells come from pre-existing cells. And cells are the fundamental units of all living things. Those two things make up really the, the two things that you should know the best. Um, living organisms consist of one or more cells. And um, during cell division, the genetic material is passed from one cell to the next. And then all cells are essentially the same, same chemically as far as their cytoplasm is concerned. They have DNA, the cell membranes, ribosomes, things like that. So on to cells. Cells, we said, are the smallest living entity of which there are many different types. And, you know, the common ones are bacteria and, and eukaryotic types of single-celled organisms such as protozoa, amoeba, algae, etc. And then we can move to complex multicellular types of organisms such as fungi or plants or humans, dogs, mice, those types of things. Now, when you look at cells, you have emergent properties that start to kind of show themselves as you look and examine the, the object that you're looking at. And what emergent properties basically are, are the attributes of an object that reveal themselves as you look more closely at it, such as with a microscope or a magnifying glass, something like that. Simply put, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So multicellular organisms, organisms show emergent properties. As a result of the interactions between the cells, the multicellular organisms can complete the functions that individual cells cannot, and therefore the complexity of the organism goes up. So as we examine something like a leaf here, you can simply see with your naked eye that you can look at the color, for instance, the veination pattern, uh, some of the texture, the different colors uh, within the leaf, the, the differences between the sides of the leaf if you look at the top versus the bottom, etc. And if you look at a microscope, uh, or get a microscope and look at the leaf that way, what you can see is that there's some uh, tissue structure that might be a little bit different within the leaf. Um, you can see like the spongy versus the palisade mesophyll if you're looking at it closely. Um, you can see the chloroplast. You can see all sorts of different types of things that are contributing to you know the, the leaf as you see it. And if you were to zoom in further with like an electron microscope, you might be able to see some of the fine ultra structure of that. And some of the things, for instance, that comprise the um, chloroplast, which is one of the organelles of the leaf. And you'd be able to see some of the thylakoid membranes and things like that. Um, looking right in here in this area, you can see these dark things are the, th uh, the thylakoid membranes. And then the individual, the whole thing there would make up the, the granum. So simply put, if you look at... Um, or examine each organism, you'll see that each component of the system reveals how the system interacts with and is dependent upon other parts of that system, how these whole things work together to kind of give the properties of the organism that it has, and those are what we refer to as the emergent properties. So if you look, for instance, instead of at a plant, if you look at a human body, you can see that there's all sorts of specialized cells that develop during differentiation, and at fertilization, the zygote begins to divide the cells start to receive the instructions that they have, and there's a number of cell divisions that take place that are responsible for dividing up the contents of the new organism. And as those things are, are divided up, the cells start to take on a lot of the functions that they're going to be charged with for um, the rest of their lives. So you can look at and see that if you've got the correct instructions, if they get laid down properly, you're going to see this, this organism is going to start to develop and uh, the um, transcription factors that it receives during the development of the organism are what's going to switch on certain genes in those certain cells and start to lay down things like the body plan so that the arms, the head, the legs, front, the back, top, bottom, those types of things start to get established as these, these cells start to grow and divide. And again, the properties of the organism begin to emerge and come out.
So now switching gears and starting to talk about the surface area to volume ratio. This is an important aspect of all cells and they have to maintain a, a specific kind of surface area to volume ratio so that they, they don't become stressed. They have to have a way to manage their metabolism. They have to have a way to manage the waste that they're producing, the nutrients that they need. And in general, cells want to have a large surface area to volume ratio. If it gets too small, the cell's getting too big, the cell's starting to grow, that's when the, the instructions are going to kind of be in place for the cell to divide so that when it gets smaller, the surface area to volume ratio will increase. So um, if you look here, you can see that on this uh, graph that we've got, you can see the, uh, the volume increases much more rapidly than the, the surface area does. And that's because the, uh, the volume increases by a, a cube, at, whereas the, um, excuse me, as the, uh, the, the surface area increases by a factor of, of two and, or a square. So um, now switching to stem cells, if we look at the stem cells here, we can see that there's two main types of stem cells that we need to be um, kind of cognizant of or, or understand what the difference between them is. You have totipotent stem cells and you have pluripotent stem cells. And early on in embryonic development, you get the, uh, uh, the totipotent stem cells, usually within the first couple of divisions, the, the eight cell stage of the organism. You might have the, the case where that um, zygote can divide, and when it does so, it can give rise to, or it can split in half and give rise to two um, genetically identical organisms, what we would call um, identical twins. And at that stage, those cells we say are totipotent in that they can give rise to any of the types of, of uh, cells in the human body, including the extra embryonic types of cells, such as the placenta. And um, the, the pluripotent stem cells, on the other hand, are those that are derived later in the organism, and they can, in fact, be harvested from uh, adult uh, somatic cells, and they can give rise to many different types of cells, just not the, the um, uh, like the placenta, they can't give rise to a whole organism. So these things are, the pluripotent stem cells are important in things like stem cell replacement and some of the new treatments that um, uh, medical experts are starting to develop. So if you look here, as these, um, the organism grows and differentiates and divides, you can see these stem cells can come from a, a late embryo or they can come from an adult um, organism. And in doing so, you can look here, these stem cells, they can, once they become specialized, they can give rise to a number of different types of tissues. So you can see the, excuse me, the blood cells, you've got nerve cells, you've got cardiac cells, liver cells, intestinal cells, muscle cells, these things are being developed, especially um, in the case of, of blood for um, the treatments of various diseases like cancer and things like that. Um, so they're very important and that's what a lot of the um, knowledge of these stem cells is used for by the experts. So if we move on to magnification and scale bars, what we've got here um, is a case where we might want to know the magnification of the cell. Um, or the magnification of the object or the magnification of the, the entire micrograph here. So with the magnification and scale bars, um, we might want to be able to calculate the, the magnification of the image. And in doing so, one of the formulas that we have to remember is magnification is equal to the image size over the actual size it represents, okay? So if we take with our ruler and we measure down here, we measure this scale bar and we find out, say, that it's two centimeters long and we can see there that it represents 40 micrometers. So what we have to do is we have to convert this two centimeters first say to uh, millimeters and then we'll convert that to micrometers knowing that one millimeter is equal to a thousand micrometers. So now we have the case here where we have 20,000 micrometers and 
it's representing 40 micrometers. So when we do the uh, um, figure out what the magnification of this image is, we're going to find out when we do the drawing that the magnification is 500x. Our units are going to cancel. There is no units with magnification. If we divide 20,000 by 40, we find out that it's 500. So we could get to another instance where we might want to know if we've got a micrograph and our teacher asks us or, or something, you know, a test question or something like that, where we're asked to find out what size of a scale bar we would need. And this is sort of a guess and check type of a thing. And if we look at this, here's a micrograph of the Ebola virus. And we know here um, from our formula, again, we're going to use the same one. Magnification is equal to the image size over the actual size it represents. So let's just say based on this drawing, we're going to draw one again that's 200, or excuse me, that's two centimeters long, okay? So we'll say we're going to draw one that's two centimeters, and we know that the magnification is 160,000 X, so we want to know, all right, how big should this be? Well, two centimeters, we said, is 20,000 micrometers, and then if we multiply this by nanometers over micrometers, we're going to get our micrometers to cancel, and then we're going to be able to figure out how many nanometers this is, because in general, when you're looking at an electron micro micrograph, oftentimes, especially when you're looking at viruses and things like that, you're going to get something in, in nanometers. So if we take 160,000 and multiply that by um, 20 million nanometers, we will find that 20 million nanometers over 160,000 will give us 125 nanometers. So if we were to draw a scale bar on this, we would draw it to be approximately, with our ruler, say two centimeters long, and then underneath there, we would put 125 nanometers. So the last thing that we might want to be able to do here is we'll be given a, a micrograph. Here we've got some red blood cells and we're given some information down here at the bottom. It tells us that this distance right here equals 10 micrometers. So with that we might take and say the question might ask what is the approximate diameter of the red blood cell? So we could take a ruler, we could take our thumb or finger or pencil or something like that and just figure out about how long or how many of these objects here could fit between here and here and we could determine half this is going to be five okay so when you look at this this is going to be approximately five maybe six microns if you're doing the estimate so because this is micrometers here you would say that the diameter the distance from here to here is approximately five or six micrometers. I hope that helps. Take care.